Hi everyone! This video is an introduction to enzymes. This is a word you've all heard before, and we've mentioned enzymes in class a few times already this year, but we haven't really looked at what enzymes are or how they work. In order to understand what enzymes are and what they do, we need to think about all the reactions occurring in living cells. And there are constantly reactions going on in living cells all the time. Lots and lots of things need to happen in your cells. So these would be reactions like dehydration and hydrolysis and other types of reactions that we haven't talked about yet. One example that we've seen fairly recently in class is when a ribosome joins amino acids together to form a protein, it's performing lots and lots of dehydration reactions. So there are tons of reactions happening all the time, and these reactions in your cells generally need some energy to get started. So this diagram will help explain what's going on there. Here we've got the amount of energy needed on this side, and this ball here is going to represent a reaction that needs to happen. And generally, reactions in cells are going to need some amount of energy to get them started, and then once they get started, the reaction will continue. So this energy that's needed to get the reaction started is referred to as the activation energy. And in this diagram, we would say that the activation energy is the difference in energy between where the reaction is starting and where it needs to go in order for it to just proceed on its own. So how much energy do we have to put in to get it going so that it'll just complete itself? An example of this in a cell might be the energy needed to strain a bond or bend it and eventually cause it to break. Or perhaps the energy needed to put atoms together in just the right way and smush them together a little bit to form a new bond. So all of these reactions are going on. They all need energy. But where do cells get the energy? If you think back to what you learned in chemistry, if we wanted a reaction to happen, we often used heat as a catalyst. And as a reminder, a catalyst is something that encourages a reaction to occur. So in chemistry, you could take your reactants, add some heat, and that would probably be enough in many cases to make the reaction happen so you could get the products that you need. But can living cells use this? Well, let's think about it. Here we have a living cell. It's got lots of things going on inside it. It needs a certain number of reactions to occur in order to keep the cell alive and keep it going. And that cell is made of all sorts of things. It's got cytoplasm and organelles and all sorts of proteins. So if we heat it up, what's gonna happen? Well, as we learned in our biological molecules unit, when proteins get exposed to extreme temperatures, they denature, they unravel, they lose their secondary and tertiary structure, and they stop functioning because of that. So if we were to expose a living cell to extreme heat, it would denature all the proteins and it would kill the cell. So cells cannot just use heat as a catalyst to make their reactions happen. They need some other way to catalyze reactions without adding heat. And that's where enzymes come in. Enzymes help catalyze these reactions. So enzymes are biological catalysts, and their job is to lower activation energy and speed up reactions in cells without increasing the temperature, without adding heat. So if we take a look at another energy diagram here, we've got two different lines, one showing the amount of energy, the activation energy that would have to go in without an enzyme, and the blue line here, I'll highlight that, showing how much energy we need once an enzyme is added. So you can see there's much less energy required to make the reaction happen if an enzyme is involved. So they lower the activation energy. Enzymes are proteins, and we learned about proteins already in our biological molecules unit. So you know that for proteins, the exact 3D shape is really important for their function, to get them to function properly. So how do they do that? How do they function? Well, first of all, we have an enzyme. And in order for the enzyme to be able to catalyze a reaction, we need some reactants. And the reactants in enzyme-catalyzed reactions are called substrates. So here's a substrate. And the substrate is going to bind to a certain part of the enzyme called an active site. And this is a specific region of the enzyme that fits together with the substrate just perfectly. So in this diagram, our active site would be there substrate would go in there, they would bind together, and that's where the reaction is going to occur, where the substrate and the enzyme are attached to each other. So in, in, a, in an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, this might be forming a bond in a dehydration reaction or breaking a bond in a hydrolysis reaction or something else. And then when the reaction is done, the enzyme will release the products. So there they go. But as you can imagine, in real life, enzymes don't really look like this. They look a little bit different. 
Here's an example of a, a model of an enzyme. This is pepsin, an enzyme in your stomach that helps you digest your food. And in this molecule, this enzyme, the active site would be in this region here, and you can see the substrate fitting into the active site shown in green and red there. So that's a more realistic view of an enzyme and its active site. Now, do you think this pepsin enzyme can act on just any substrate? Can it take in anything and perform a reaction? And the answer is no. Each enzyme is really specific and can only act on specific substrates, usually only one specific substrate. And the reason for that is because the enzyme and the substrate have a lock and key fit. They have to fit together just right with their shapes matching up exactly. So here is one type of enzyme and its specific substrate. You can see they match up. Here's a different type of enzyme and its substrate. And you can see that once again, they match up perfectly. But this enzyme would not work with this substrate and vice versa. So this is part of why that exact 3D shape is so important for, for enzymes. Enzymes and substrates also have something called induced fit. And this refers to the idea that when a substrate binds to the active site of an enzyme, the enzyme adjusts its shape to fit the substrate even more closely. So in this diagram here, we have our enzyme. Substrate will enter the active site, and you can see once they're together, the enzyme further adjusts its fit here. It sort of tightens a little bit, so they fit together just perfectly. It's kind of like a handshake or a hug. When you go to shake someone's hand, you stick your hand out straight, but once it meets with the hand, you don't leave it there straight. You wrap around their hand a little bit. So that's what the enzyme does to the substrate. And this induced fit helps encourage the reaction, whether it's breaking a bond or forming a bond, that induced fit will help it happen more easily. So the substrate binds to an enzyme that matches up perfectly to its shape, the enzyme adjusts for an even better fit, and then a reaction occurs. But what happens to the enzyme? Does this enzyme get used up in the process of the reaction? The answer is no. Enzymes do not get used up in reactions. Each enzyme can catalyze its specific reaction over and over again. So here's an enzyme. It's going to act on these two substrates, put them together. So once the substrates have bound to the active site, a dehydration reaction will occur. And then the enzyme releases the product. And then it's free to start all over again. So the enzyme itself is not changed in the reaction process. It can do it over and over again. One way I like to think about it is, if I have a substrate of ice cream and I put it in the enzyme that is the blender, I'll put it in the active site near the blades and make a milkshake and release that as my product, but then I can do it over and over again because the blender itself, the enzyme, is not changed or affected. One last thing to know about enzymes is a little bit about how we name them because they all have original and unique names. So each enzyme has a name that generally refers to its substrate or its product or the reaction that it's catalyzing. And the names usually end in ACE, that suffix A-S-E. So to show you an example, here I've got an enzyme and the substrate that this enzyme happens to act on is lactose. So this enzyme, once lactose fits into its active site, the enzyme will hydrolyze the lactose into its monomers. Do you remember what they are for lactose? Yeah, it's glucose and galactose. So because this enzyme acts on lactose, and it's an enzyme, we'll add that ACE to the end of it, and it is called lactase. Similarly, if we had an enzyme that hydrolyzes sucrose into glucose and fructose, because it acts on sucrose, we might call the enzyme sucrase. So now you know the basics of what enzymes are and how they work. In class, we'll take a look at factors that can affect the rates of enzyme-catalyzed reactions, so things that might slow them down or make them speed up. But until then, take care of yourself, take care of each other.